Hi, I'm Emma Clark, and this is Before the Bar Opens, the podcast about what happens before the music starts. I talk to people who make, use, and love music. Chris Danat is radio royalty. He was at the cutting edge of commercial radio from its earliest days and is the creative director of Pirate Memories, an exhibition that celebrates the world of pirate radio. He's worked in radio his whole working life. It's fair to say his entire career has been built on recording, producing and broadcasting music. I want to know about his time as a radio pirate and what life was like aboard a 1960s pirate radio ship. But let's start at the beginning, before the music started. When did you fall in love with music radio, Chris? (laughs) Radio? Um, Radio was a long time coming really, because um, I was the sort of product of a working class family. And radio for me really was the light programme, the BBC, which was dreadful. I didn't like the old fashioned programmes. When I was young, I used to pinch my brother's records. He was uh, a bit older than I was. (laughs) He was 13 years older and he'd had a record player for some years. But at eight or nine years old, I was suddenly playing records by Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and Manfred Mann. And he had a few Beatles and Rolling Stones and stuff. This was the early 60s. But for somebody like me, as I say, at that age, to be sort of listening to this other stuff was interesting. How was it when you first heard that kind of music? I'd sort of listened to the BBC, the band, doing their interpretations of the Beatles numbers of the day and things. It was dreadful, absolutely awful. <laughs> to hear the real thing was great. And um, my mum used to say to me, because as I say, I was only young, she used to stick her head around the door and say, if, he, if your brother comes home, boy, you're in trouble with that. You shouldn't be playing those, you know, and that was it. Oh, so you but, listened in secret. Oh, yeah. I was sneaking into his bedroom and, and, and listening to these things. It sounded like you were craving something other than the BBC was serving up. Oh, yeah. This was where the rebellion started with me, I guess, because when I listened to I mean, the other one, of course, was Radio Luxembourg. They were playing dance bands, but it was all commercial programming. So you were actually rebelling against what you could hear on the radio that was available to you? I think so, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the thing that I hated about Radio Luxembourg was that they would play about a minute of the latest Beatles song, and then it was, hey, you know, we're going to play the next one now, and zip straight into the next one. No. And, of course, the airtime at Radio Luxembourg was all bought up by the big record companies, and what they wanted to do was they wanted to play a little snippet of this latest hit, or it was going to be a hit. And, of course, you would nip out the following morning and nip to the record shop and buy it. And that's all they, all they were interested in doing. So they only served up teasers? Yeah, that's right. And it was programme after programme after programme, all doing the same thing. But they were the big companies. They were EMI, they were Pi. No, Chris, I never uh, knew this, that. I just... Yeah. Yeah. I just assumed that they'd play you the no, whole no. tune. <laughs> no, they uh, they they basically wanted to flog records. That that was the whole premise. And this really was where pirate radio came in. Just very briefly to put you in the picture of how I got into the pirate radio side of it was that I went to a grammar school where everybody was talking about pirate radio, and I went on holiday during 1965 after Dad died, and and we went to a, one of my aunties and uh, one of her neighbours had a big Bakelite radio on the window ledge in her dining room. And of course, she had this pop music on all the day. And I just said, look, you know, what is this? Where's this from? Because Luxembourg was the only radio station and that was on at night. But uh, this was this was genuine, proper pop music. It was the Beatles. It was the Stones. There were lots of other stuff as well that I'd never heard. They were playing um, lots of um, music by American artists, such as the Supremes and the Four Tops and the Isley Brothers. And, you know, this was Motown. This was where Motown came in. And I said, well, you know, who is this? Where, where's this radio station? And she said, oh, it's, it's coming from London. And uh, she said, well, no, I'm not certain it is. She says it might be called Radio London, but she says, I'm not really sure. Um, well, anyway, they're going to close it down soon because it's not very legal or something. And she didn't know anything else other than that. Wow. But of course, when I came back, went to the grammar school, all the kids were talking about Radio London and they all, they all one of these little transistor radios with an earpiece. And some of them were actually, oh, we, we did it. I did it sitting there in the in the classroom, listening to the French lesson while you were listening to Radio London in the ear. So it was a real word of mouth thing. Kids shared this information with other kids and it just propagated. It was it went viral to use modern terminology. It, it did. Um as you say, very much by word of mouth. But, um, you know, when I went back home and had a bit of a fiddle around with our transistor radio, I found I got a really, really good signal into it by plugging it into the old tele aerial, which was outside on the roof. 
and I used to unplug the telly and plug the TV area into the back of this into the back of this transistor set, and it worked really well. Homework could wait. I was sitting there listening. And I was, you know, this was this was like you know, stay at home, Chris. I was the one that sat at home. I wasn't out playing with my mates anymore. I was glued to the radio all the time. Listening to Chris, it sounded like people's love of music and somehow their need for music created a cultural phenomenon that became commercial radio. Of course, with it being not very legal, the government decided that they were going to close it down and they shut the whole lot down in 1967. But, um, you know, that sort of feeling for me lived on. I mean, I'd, I'd got my own record player by then. I'd started to buy a few records. Of course, with Dad passing away, Mum had been sort of like both parents to me. She'd worked sure. for three jobs to get me through grammar school. Wow. And uh, when grammar school came to an end, around about sort of early 1970, I guess it would have been, I didn't get a chance to go off to college or think about university or anything. I don't, I don't think I was brainy enough, frankly. I'd, you know, I'd, I'd hated most of the time at the school as it was. Mm. But, um, you know, this love of music had, had been there all the time. In fact, during the last year, we, we actually ran a pop music club at the school because, it, you know, we had a, I took my record player in and a bundle of records and we charged everybody a penny at lunchtime to get in. <laughs> How much money did you make? Well, well, we made we made about one on threatens, I think, uh, on lunch times. And that was uh, big money. Well, it, well, it was fair. It was you know nice little learner, but I mean, I I sometimes used to go off and once I'd got a, a bit of a collection of cash, I'd nip off and buy another record and things like that. But that's how it was. There was no such thing then as mobile disco, if you like. But uh, that's where I ended up being this pirate Johnny. I decided that it was a good idea to, in the meantime of, of all of this lot going in the background, I'd had the record player, I'd bought a tape recorder as well, and. Uh, an old reel to reel, and um, I then recorded a, a whether well, these days they call it a demo tape, of me just sitting in the bedroom and in, in introducing records and put this tape in a box and sent it to a chap, um, and I and I really don't know I can't remember I've got the letter somewhere but uh, he was at BBC Radio Nottingham, was one of the first BBC local radio stations that originally came to replace the pirates that had been closed in 1967. Because the BBC must have known there was a market there that they needed to oh, yeah, yeah. cater to, presumably. Not, not to go back too much into the pirate radio history, but the thing is, they came uh, when, when the pirates closed. I mean, it was the government, it was Harold Wilson that actually twisted the BBC's arm and said, look, we're sort of cheating 25 million people out of listening to pop music on the radio. Absolutely. You guys are going to have to get something sorted out. And that's where Radio 1 came in. Radio 2. But then, of course, then came the BBC local radio stations in the early 70s. I mean, I, I went up and just sort of appeared there every Saturday. This is really where, where the sort of pirate bit came in, because even though I got a BBC training for free, if you like, back in 1972, I sat in on this programme for 45 minutes every Saturday lunchtime during the afternoon when the sports people were in, would run, fetch coffees and spool tapes. And that's how I got this training from the Beeb, as it were, back in 72. So it sounds like your journey into music and into music radio, it, it was a real passion. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. Something that you loved and sustained you throughout the loss of your father, being at a school where you didn't feel properly you <laughs> yeah that's yeah that's right it really feels yeah. like you found a home in music yeah. and in radio yeah the thing was that when i sent this tape to the to the, this guy at the bbc he sent me the usual uh, letter back saying hey not a bad tape well actually it's not good but uh, you'll you'll probably never make a radio dj well yeah all right we've, we've done that um <gasps> what a thing to say <laughs> but why not use your records go off and talk to the chap who runs your local youth club you might be able to set up a disco in your local youth club well i did better than that because in in 1973 i set up my own disco company i'd been working for a, a, another outfit these were a couple of xraf guys and uh, they set up um, what you would now call a mobile disco, but this was like a stage setup that they took out with amplifiers and speakers and lights. And uh, I, I worked for them. They gave me a little spot where a lot of the Saturday evening village hall type things were very much ballroom dancing. It was it was waltzes and quick steps and the old time valitas and all that sort of thing. And uh, there was a little tiny spot of sort of half an hour in the middle where they played a bit of pop music. And that's what I did. I went out with these people for the best part of seven years. But back in 73, I'd started to build my own stuff and I did do those youth club jobs and that's where music, you know, really came in. I had a job then, as I say, I, I didn't do college. I went to work, I got a job and uh, I was working in a garage. But uh, during that time, you know, working during the daytime, going out, this going at night and, uh, you know, the music collection grew 
this was all thanks to the pirate radio stuff. This was the aim. Maybe not to be on the radio, but certainly to get out there and play the music. And I did this and uh, finally sold the, the disco company in 2008. So, uh, you know, didn't do too badly, really. And it sounds like you were having this rich musical education from the BBC, from the guy at Radio Nottingham when you were kind of there, just present while they were doing the show, then with the guy with the disco. And it's just like you were soaking up Absolutely. everything yeah. that was available to you just to learn and learn and learn. I think that I personally, in my feelings, I was, I, was, I was so into it anyway. Girlfriends were second place to it. A lot of that time we played lots and lots of various places around the area. We went outside the area as well, you know, I don't know how people became knowledgeable about where we were and what we did, but, you know, we had a following. And I remember, in fact, I still got this little note that was pushed through my door once, and this was probably mid-70s from somebody. It looked like a young lady's handwriting. Please, Chris, put a note in your window when you are going to run your next disco. Everybody around here is talking about it. Please let us know. We will know that you're going to run a disco when you put the poster in your window. So there were others like you, Chris. There were other people yearning for this music, yearning for some kind of... I don't know, some kind of connection, a way to bond with other people and just just experience music together. I think the way that the music had come along by then, of course, but the 60s, you know, the 60s, you had all this, this fantastic music explosion. I mean... They called it the British invasion in the States, didn't they? I mean, yeah, the Beatles yeah, and yeah. the Stones and Dave Clark and Herman's Hermits and all these all these sort of bands. I enjoyed this music firsthand from the radio and obviously it was then being able to stand up on a stage and play it to people. And, you know, that was the enjoyment that they got from coming to discos that I did. I was also able to go out there and do what I actually thought I did best. I was also involved with some people locally who for a good 20 odd years had been presenting a, a one hour show a week on a local hospital radio station. They had a little record turntable and a microphone and they used to take it to the top of the a building right at the top of the lift shaft. And that's how they used to do it. Well, I got involved with these folks and we eventually ended up designing and building a studio. In fact, the guys that I'd worked for on this disco previously, they were electronics engineers. and We actually put a proper radio, proper hospital radio station together, broadcasting seven nights a week so I was quite pleased with that that was another thing that that, that sort of prompted the, the sort of you know this this lean towards the radio let me just ask you actually because I'm fascinated with pirate radio mm. tell me what it is if you want to know about the origin we're going back to those 60s times because the BBC didn't play much, very many records because they weren't allowed to Radio Luxembourg only played a minute or so of each track. A guy actually called Ronan O'Reilly was a, an Irish fellow. He was managing a, a blues artist called Georgie Fame, a very good pianist and organist and, uh, and, and had some big hits in the 1960s. But before he was famous, Ronan O'Reilly, a uh, manager for, for Georgie, said rather rashly, I'll get you a record deal. Well, they managed <laughs> to get a, they got a record, as you do, they got a record made. But then, of course, Ronan went off to the offices at the Radio Luxembourg, who listened to it and said, hmm, yeah, it's a good tune, but we don't we don't play new black artists. And Ronan looked at them and really? said, Georgie, Georgie Fame lives in Lancashire. <laughs> so, they actually said, yeah, we don't play, we don't play new black, new black artists. artists. Yeah. Uh, so he, he said, right, okay, fine. And off he went round the corner to the BBC, who said, um, well, yeah, fine, okay, but, uh, you know, we, we're not sort of taking new artists on at this moment in time. He, he sort of picked the record up and put it back in his briefcase and said, well, that's fine. If I can't get it played at Luxembourg and I can't get it played here, the only thing I'm going to have to do then is set up my own radio station. Now, there was no such thing in those days. People had to be licensed to operate radio equipment and so on. Sure. Uh, Luxembourg was out of this country. They were in they were in Europe, so they didn't you know they just broadcast into the country and didn't they didn't need a license as such. So Ronan decided that he was going to set up a radio station, and there'd been a radio station on the Dutch coast for uh, about eighteen months called Radio Veronica. They they'd set a ship up, and uh, they used to send out recordings on tape and the tapes were played from the boat rather than having somebody sitting in a studio on board. So that's where the pirate thing came from because they were on ships. They were literally yeah. on ships. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The idea was to get outside the what was the three mile limit in those days. If you put a boat outside there, it's, you're in what they call international waters. Which is presumably why it had to be offshore. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. So that legally they weren't under any specific jurisdiction. They, they weren't illegal, but they were outside of the law. So they were literally pirates. Yeah, that, <laughs> well, that's, as I say, being on the ship and, and waving and, and sort of cocking a snook at what was going on legally, they, that, that's exactly what they were. Where did they get the boats? The, uh, the the original ship that Ronan bought was a Danish ferry, and it was probably 30 years old when he got it in 1962. They got transmitters from America. In fact, um, the story of how Caroline got its name was that Ronan was on a plane flying to the States to talk to the Americans about building some transmitters for, for this proposed station. And he opened a magazine and there was John F. Kennedy sitting at his desk in the Oval Office and who's playing under his feet but Caroline Kennedy. The, you know, she was about four years old and she was disrupting government was what the thing said. <laughs> and so that's why Roland thought, hey, Radio Caroline, read a good name because that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to uh, disrupt the uh, the sort of like the status quo over here. He wanted to be able to get out and play people's music. And it really wasn't about making huge amounts of money. It was actually about getting new music onto the radio. When Caroline came on, they said within about six or seven weeks that they'd got about seven or eight million listeners, which, I mean, if you can imagine all those people used to listen to the BBC. The thing was, though, that the BBC were their own worst enemies because they didn't try and do anything. And uh, when I started to listen to this lot, this is where I sort of got towed along by all of this. The pirates thing sort of continued, but over the years and certainly into the 1970s, I mean, there was I, I was busy running this disco and I was happily doing that the hospital radio thing came along. And then in 1980, I started doing some nightclubs and things like that. The, the DJing side of it had taken off for me. I was self-employed. I was working for Mecca, Mecca agency, doing some of the Tiffany's nightclubs. We did all that. And then in the 80s, I sort of really got to a bit of a point where I was looking for something. And um, in 1983, I took a phone call from a, a fella and, and he said, um, I've got a job for you. It's going to be outside the country. Have you got a passport? I said, mm, well, I can get one. I said, why? What, what is it? You see, thinking it was a nightclub work. And he said, uh, well, I can't really tell you much about it, Chris. He said, it's, it's, it's a bit hush-hush at the moment. I said, oh, come on. You know, you've got, to, you've got to tell me something. I said, I can't just say, yes, OK, I'm coming to do this and then find out that I've wasted my time. Uh, but he was very insistent. He wouldn't tell me. So he literally said, come abroad. You've got to get a passport. I'm going to take you somewhere. Yeah. It's going to be great. Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. The, the situation I'd been in was that um, I'd been in a road accident two years previously to that, and I'd, I'd just about got my businesses back running, the disco side of it and what have you. So it really wasn't, at that point, it really wasn't financially viable for me to just say, well, you know, I'm going to throw all this lot up and, and go off and, on, on something that, you know, could have been a hide into nothing at all. Who can say <laughs> that on such flimsy information? Well, you know, there's a, a, an old saying, you know, you, everyone's allowed one major faux pas but uh, this this yeah. one was it was the, you know I talk about making myself look an idiot i turned it down and then a few weeks later the new radio caroline came back broadcasting from a bigger ship broadcasting from international waters um, it was an it was an ex grimsby fishing trawler this thing called the ross revenge it was huge and uh, a big mast on it, massive transmitters. And of course, I then realised that I could have been one of the original crew that brought Radio Caroline back after it had been off for about five years in 1983. And um, that was when really I, I started to do a little bit of radio production. I went to Southern Ireland in 1987, worked on a number of rather less than legal radio stations, I think, in uh, various different places. You're a born rebel, aren't you, Chris? Yeah, Absolutely. I went to, uh, I went, uh, in fact, this guy rang me up. I was working at a station in Wicklow. And uh, this chap ran me from a town called Nace. It's not far from Dublin. And said, oh, we've listened, we've heard you on the radio. Well, you know, you come up and have a, a chat with us. <laughs> went up. And uh, this was a little studio, as he put it, above a hairdresser's on Nace High Street. It was like the, the living room of the flat was the studio. There was a pair of disco decks nailed to the wall. And um, all the records were piled in a big heap. And there wasn't one cover on any of the discs. They were all just bare plastic discs but this was z104 and it was <laughs> listening to it on the radio you would have thought it was this massive american style radio station with all big studios and this that and the other and it was a little tiny sort of but it was just above hairdressers and it was hairdressers yeah but uh, it sounded fantastic on here massive you know big american jingles and all this sort of thing it was great but um i came back to to britain thinking i really should do something and we set up a little pirate radio station locally up here ran sort of two or three nights a week but everything was recorded onto cassettes and <laughs> you know we, we, we weren't going to sort of put ourselves in the firing line I mean and then the 
legitimate job came out the radio one day. I was listening to it and uh, it turned out it was a recruitment. They were looking for someone to write radio commercials. I stuck this demo tape together and put a letter off and sent it off to them. Uh, a week later, got a letter from them saying, come on for an interview. Well, I thought, oh, right oh. There was 50-odd people went for this thing. And a week later, I got another one saying, come for a second interview. I thought, oh, right, okay, we're doing well here. I went across and had a, a sort of one-to-one with the guy who was the sales manager then. And uh, he just said, oh, I'm going to take you to the studio and show you around. And that, now, that was, a, that was a great deal because, you know, I love the technical end of it as well. This, you know, all the studios and the fittings and what the, uh, this was, this was pucker stuff. You know, this was the real deal. The chap took me into what was the commercial production studio and uh, and he said you know this introduced me to the chap that was actually still there working on some commercials he said oh you know have 10 minutes with him and then when you finish throw him out sort of thing so <laughs> I sat down and this 10 minutes ended up being nearly an hour and a half um, a week later I got an, an offer of the job but um, that was writing I mean I, I went into commercial radio I was actually a, a copywriter I'd, I'd, I'd sort of done stuff in Ireland but I suppose I, I thought it was okay and it, it seemed to come out all right and you know the end product was okay but um, six weeks after I started as a writer the sales manager strolled into the office one morning and he said oh they said that the, the engineer guy who was who you spoke to Chris he said he's going to be off for about six weeks he's gone for a minor operation he said you've done this studio like this was his exact words you've done this studio like before nip in there and start pushing buttons <laughs> it sounds like slowly you were making yourself indispensable well, not in, not initially. No, I uh, I went. You're in, being uh, modest. Well, I'm trying, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I seriously, I mean, I, I was bricking myself when I went in there. I thought, oh my god, you know, this is this is real. And slowly but surely, things started to get a bit easier. But this guy never came back. This engineer guy, and uh, when he did come back, he he actually went back into another department in the radio station as a as a presenter. I was involved with one of these the very first gold radio stations. And I mean, that for me was brilliant because the gold station was playing all that music that I'd been involved with and I'd listened to back in the pirate days. In fact, the station actually had a number of the radio jingles advertising the station name were sung by the same people that recorded the jingles for the pirates back in the 60s. It's a small community though, radio, yeah. isn't it? It really is. But to, to hear those old jingles again with an up-to-date sort of feel with the, with, the, with the name of the station that I was working with at the time, it was absolutely amazing. And, you know, that, that, that all this, this sort of pirate feeling came back. It was like, you know, God, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working in this thing. You know, it's all on land and all the rest of it, but it sounds just like I'm working for the pirates. It, it was just amazing. And the station got taken over. Another company moved in and bought us out. Then we went digital as well. We actually dropped a lot of the old tapes and that type of thing. We, we managed to get one of these very early digital editing systems. And I always say to people now, and certainly as far as production's concerned, we started being award winners when we got the digital system in. Yes. It simplified things so much, it made sure. my job a lot easier. But the fact is, we could do so much more with it. Tell me what the audio was like on the pirate ships. Did they store all the records on board? Did they get wet? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, well, well, I mean, everything was run uh, like a proper radio station. The only downside was it was three miles out. Did anybody ever get seasick? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, this is a very well-known DJ, worked for Radio 1 and Radio Luxembourg and a number of others, but he's actually on a radio station off the North Yorkshire coast called Radio 270, and he introduces an advertisement for Danish bacon, He's introducing how yummy this Danish bacon was and literally everything goes a bit quiet for a second and he'd actually switch the mic off to throw up into a bucket oh in the studio because <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing was rolling around so badly. Um, and he had to talk about <laughs> bacon. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, so, yeah, I mean, everything was fine. It was, a, it was a radio station. It had its own record stock. It had equipment on board to play the records. They had equipment on board to play the, all the, the jingles and the commercials and this, that, and the other. And staff were on board. There was no voice tracking or computerized programming in those days. Literally, everything was on reels of tape if the weather got really bad. But, um, you know, the radio station was, you know, it's its own separate entity. There was, I think there were seven boats actually around the, the UK coasts at one point with these separate different radio stations on. Some a lot better than the other. But the big ones, obviously, Caroline and Radio London back then, you know, you would have not, if you walked into the studio, you would have thought you were in a, 
a proper full setup studio somewhere on land. So it was all kitted out. Oh, it yeah. wasn't like you were on some sort of shonky ship. The, the ships were dreadful. I mean, the Radio London vessel back in 1966, it was a, a product of World War II. It had been a US minesweeper back in, uh, in, in the Pacific and uh, had won citations and all sorts of stuff for minesweeping and picking up downed air crew and all sorts of stuff. They bought this thing for about $60,000, I mean, which, was, which was peanuts then in those days. But a lot of money, but, uh, you know, for something that big. Um, but the US Navy just wanted rid of all these things at that point, and so they just they got rid. But the ship itself was a sturdy animal. She was a 1,000 tonnes and, and just sat there in the water. The Ross Revenge, the, new, the one that Caroline are still using, in fact, they use it as a tourist attraction now. Caroline have sort of become part of the establishment now because they've got their own broadcast license these days. And good luck to them. So they're legal. Yeah, good, good, they've they've yeah, crossed the line. Yeah, good luck to them. But uh, <laughs> the ship is, is still moored in the River Blackwater, just in, in the Thames estuary. They've become legitimate, but they've still got that pirate edge, which is the bit I like about it all. They've never forgotten the roots, which is what it's all about. I guess that that's where I am with it because uh, most of the commercial side of it that I do now, I've only got here because of the work I put in from these pirate days. Had it not been for them, I don't think that I, well, I don't know what sort of course I'd have gone on. I worked in a garage and I suppose that, you know, I probably might have ended up doing that. But um, the love of the music, I think, kept it all going. And that was that's the bit. I've never lost that interest. Chris spoke passionately about the homogenisation, the blandification of commercial radio in the UK. Suffice to say, he's not impressed with the lack of musical choice available in many radio station playlists these days. I have to say, though, that um, these days I tend not to listen to the radio much. I make up my own music. And again, this is a, a bit piratey, I guess, because the... Uh, some of the very good radio stations have, have been taken over by companies that don't run them how they should, or, or I'm probably that's, that's being a bit critical, I guess, but you know they've probably got their own ideas about what they want. But I do really think that the listener comes second with a lot of all this, and um, you know it's not my cup of tea. And I don't get a kick out of, of, of a lot of new music, unfortunately, which is a bit of a shame, really, because I do try and appreciate it. I do listen to some of this, and I try, but I, it all, you know, you, I'm, this is a sign of getting old. <laughs> People come out and say, oh, it all sounds the blooming same. Well, yeah, it does, unfortunately. <laughs> far too many far too many finger clicks and drum machines and, and nasal singing voices and things like that. I wish somebody would do something a bit different. But anyway, that's just my opinion, folks. Tell me how you choose what to put in a radio playlist. Oh, that's a difficult one. I look at radio stations that I think probably got it wrong. And I've also looked at radio stations that I think have got it, or did get it right, but they got it right, I suppose, by default. And one example, obviously, is this gold station that I worked for because they had all the music there. This was all original music. It had already been there. People were already comfortable with it. And, and it wasn't just 60s. They would play 50s, 60s, 70s and into the 80s. And I won't say that some of the music that they played was actually particularly well known. I mean, they, they went outside the box a bit playing tracks that maybe were one-hit wonders and things like that. Some of them haven't made the charts probably, but, you know, you'd heard them on the radio. I think as well, I, I don't think it's just down to playlist. I think it's down to personality. And I think the guys that were playing those, well, the guys and the girls that were playing that music in, in those days had a winning formula because they had the music for a start. Everybody knew it. Mm -hmm. It was familiar. They also then had some personalities, some guys that uh, girls behind the microphone that knew about the music as well. I, I listen to some of these people today, a particular radio station owned by the BBC, and I won't go into too many details, but you know who I'm on about. It's just a series of TV personalities, one after another, with the odd DJ thrown into the mix. I worry about it because I'm just thinking, well, fine, you know, you've, you've got probably one of the biggest listenerships in the country, but are you actually really giving people what they want? I, I'm, I don't want it. This is why I tune out. And I'm, there's, a, there's a radio station on, on DAB now called Boom, and they're looking at playing a very, very wide selection of music going back from the 40s right up to the present day. They will play some new tunes. But I think the mix that they're doing outweighs everything that this BBC station is doing. And if Boom was on Terrestrial FM and this, that and the other and DAB as well and, and such like, I think that this BBC station, they would have a big competitor. So it sounds like for you, a good playlist is something that's diverse. It's got variety yeah. and it reflects the personality of the presenter. The personality of the presenter. I mean, the guy, he's the guy that links all this together. I want somebody to be able to entertain and I just think I think it's very it's very sort of close together this stuff it's it's all a bit insular and if you're trying to affect the listener 
then you're not doing. You're talking at the listener, not to them. And indeed, I mean, the old adage back in the pirate days was you're only talking to one person. You're talking into a microphone, but there's actually only one person the other side of that, which in essence there is. Yeah. People might be driving in a car or listening when they're doing the washing up or whatever, but, you know, they are tending to listen to it. It's wallpaper. It's on in the background. It's part of people's lives, isn't it? And it's a very intimate thing, radio, isn't it? Because like you say, you hear it in your own private space, whether you're in the car, in your own kitchen. Yeah. It's in your world, so it's it's intimate. Hopefully the radio station will play something that's th- that you are happy with in your own world. A lot of very good radio stations are all now owned by the same companies, and I don't think that's a good idea either. But having said that, if you look at the financial situation, I think that the way they were set up in the first place was wrong. Way too many restrictions and, and, and you can't do this and you can't do that. You've got to have certain soundproofing uh, elements in your studio and all of this gear. And people wasted thousands and thousands of pounds on that when they probably should have been doing more about getting listeners in. It's about the content. Yeah. You've got to connect. And I don't think some of this stuff does. And that's the shame with it, really. Chris told me about his exhibition, Pirate Memories. He said that when people come to see it, they're taken back to another time, another place. When we take the Pirate Radio exhibition out, that's a collection of original... I mean, and these are, I have to say, these are original pieces. These are not stuff that we've photocopied or we've had reprinted or anything. These are original photographs. These were blow-ups of original prints. There's about 140 major pictures of most of the Pirate Radio stuff from the 1960s and early 70s. In the meantime, I've trawled the internet and I spent an absolute fortune on eBay, frankly, over the years, buying <laughs> little rare bits. And some of them, I'd say, are unique. But these are these could be just like receipts from a hotel or they could be a ticket for a gig advertising a pirate radio disc jockey of the time. Very evocative objects, though, really bringing you back yeah. to a specific yeah. moment in time. But the interesting bit about it, Emma, is when we would set these things up, we would open the doors and, I mean, We did some work with the BBC some years ago and 4,000 odd people came through in a matter of a few days to see what we were doing, to see the exhibition. Everybody was saying the same thing when they came in. I remember what we were doing then. I saw this. I heard that. And this was where it links into the memories. And this is why I called it Pirate Memories, because the thing was that people would take a look at a picture And automatically the old imagination and the brain is starting to work and they've got a picture there and all of a sudden it comes out, hey, I remember this, where was we when we heard this? Oh, yeah, I remember we were such and such. And they would go along with all of of these stories. And it was just, we we spent hours and hours listening to people recounting this. And it wasn't just one or two people that came in. What kind of things were they remembering? Well, they were remembering where they were when they heard a particular piece of music. In 1966, one of the Caroline ships went ashore at Frinton. They they got caught up in a bit of a storm. The anchor chain broke and the ship ended up on the foreshore at uh, Holland Haven, which is just down from Frinton. Now, they could have lost the boat. I mean, there's recordings of Tony Blackburn and Dave Lee Travis and a number of others that were on board that night saying that, uh, you know, had this ship gone 10 yards either way, that it would have gone up a, a big concrete sort of breakwater thing and the whole thing would have broken apart and that would have been it. They would have lost a lot and possibly even lives. But these sort of memories, these people were, were coming back with all of this stuff and, you know, they'd, they'd take a look at a picture and they'd say, oh, right, yes, I remember that. Oh, yeah, that's such and such. And they, you know, they could recognise the DJs and so on. I mean, and this this shows what sort of impact that listening to that pirate radio back then had with these folks. All these years later, they're remembering it all. And it only takes listening to a piece of music or perhaps looking at a picture for suddenly all to come pouring out. And that was the bit that uh, that did me. And, and one particular case, if we've got enough time to tell you about this very briefly. Yeah, yeah. I was out shopping in Harwich and my mobile phone went. It was my ex-wife. And she said, you've got to come back. There's a chap here who needs to speak to you about something. I said, right, OK. I shot back to the, our exhibition and there was a very elderly gentleman sitting at, the, at one of the tables in the cafe just outside where we, where we were showing our exhibition. And I went across and I said, uh, you know, can I help you? He said, um, yeah, could you tell me if anybody's here at this broadcast that was on the Mi Amigo, the Radio Caroline ship that went aground in January of 1966? And I said, well, yes, actually, I, there, there are. There's a couple of Australian chaps that are here. So anyway, I, I rescued these two and I said, look, there's a fella down over here. He wants to have a chat with you, see? So of course they came and sat down at the table. And one of them was a, a bit of a loquacious Australian chap called Norman. And he's, he sat down and, ah, oh, good day, mate, how are you? Bloody nice day, isn't it? All this sort of stuff. <laughs> he's giving it all this. 
And he said, uh, you know, what can I do for you, Brad? And, and so the old chap said, um, were you on board the Mi Amigo on the night that it went to ground? And Norm, oh, yeah, it was a bloody hard night that was, mate. We nearly died. And the, the old fella never never blinked. He just looked the guy straight in the eye and he said, well, I was one of the fellas that got you off the ship. Wow. And <laughs> Norm was never one for losing his words, but he just absolutely clammed up. And, you know, this old chap was part of the Coast Guard crew. This chap was still alive. He'd come along. And uh, I left them to it in the end because there was lots of handshakes and back slapping going on and a few tears. And I thought, this is so personal. You know, I'm, I'm sort of like a bit of a, a bit of an interloper here. I'll leave them to it. I just wish, though, that I'd had a recorder, a tape recorder or a cassette recorder or something and just left it on the table to hear what they'd got to say about that whole thing because that was very, very powerful. This is all down to the memories. And, and you know, he'd heard about the broadcast. He was sort of like he had to come down and he had to find out whether or not there was anybody about from then. And, uh, and you know, all those years later, it was just amazing. That is an amazing story. Well, it, it, I say it, it's been a magical time. It still is. I uh, still get a kick out of all this. And more recently, with the internet radio side of it, I've produced a number of programmes called Chris Day. I don't use the name Chris Dannett on air, but uh, Chris Day's Pirate Gold is the programme. It all sounds a bit twee, but it's a lot of recordings of the radio stations and interlinked with music of the time. And um, if you look at the, the sort of 60s pirate radio, it actually only lasted from 64 to 1967, three years. But there was a hell of a lot went on in those three years. And culturally, its influence is still being felt. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can't mention it to the kids these days. I mean, you know, the technology is not the same at all. It's completely different. And the kids have what they have and they're very used to it. Yes. And, um, you know, these days, you know, I very often say to someone, I would pick up a cassette deck, a little, you know, the, the, the player that used to play the cassettes, it was battery powered. Yes. And I would say to them, this is a 1965 iPod. <laughs> the collection of stuff is paramount. A lot of this stuff, some of it's unique. And I've got to keep that collection. I've got to keep it going. I've got to keep looking after it because we went to the media museum, TV, radio, film, photography, uh, the Media Museum in Bradford. And I said to them, I said, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's always very, very nice, but we're all set out and everything. Uh, what about radio? And the lady, the, the, uh, the lady I was speaking to, she said, oh, yeah, radio. I said, I think we've got some of that stuff somewhere. I said, somewhere? I said, well, where, where do you mean somewhere? I said, is it out on display? She said, well, no, so I think it's probably in the back. I said, why is it in the back? You know, surely it doesn't radio count. And she said, well, we, we know we haven't got very many places to exhibit it, this, that and the other. And I'm thinking, well, all right. So anyway, she took us, we, we went into what they call the back room tour. They gave us a pair of these uh, little linen gloves. And, uh, and she said, oh, I'll, I'll bring some files out. And she brought uh, a number of these brown leaflet type files and popped them on the desk. And as I say, we started to root through these things. And uh, I said, these were, these were original Associated Press photographs. I said, how many of these have you got? And she said, oh, there's a lot. She said, this is just a handful out of one of the drawers. I said, uh, how much stuff have you actually got there? Well, she said, we've got 74 filing cabinets. So that's seven, 74 cabinets times four, because they were all four drawers. And these are all pictures from Associated Press, and they're all to do with pirate radio. And there was not one of those things on display in what is supposed to be the media museum. So this sort of spurred me on to carry on taking our exhibition out and showing it. The whole thing, really, as I say, had it not been for the fact that I pinched my brother's records back in 1962, I wouldn't be doing this now. <laughs> it's a bit of a it's a bit of a strange road to have come along, but um, I'm happy with what I'm doing. It really sounds, listening to you, that the the legacy of music and the memories and the honouring the importance of it is really important to you. I don't know where we would be without music. I think, uh, I think it would be a bit of a boring old place, really. All the show notes for this episode are available in the description, and there's a bunch more stuff at beforethebaropens.com. Before the Bar Opens is created by me, Emma Clark, and is produced by Rick Watson. I compose the theme music. If you'd like to leave us a voice message and maybe be featured in a future episode of Before the Bar Opens, check out the show notes and follow the Leave Us a Voice Message link. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave us a review, hopefully a lovely one, and tell your friends. Another episode will be along very soon, so don't miss it. Thanks for listening. <laughs>